In this video, we're going to discuss memory errors, forgetting, and the ways in which we can use the information that psychologists have learned about memory to enhance our learning. Now I'm going to start by discussing short-term memory errors, the ways in which we forget. There are two main types. The first is known as decay, and this is when information in our short-term memory simply fades over time. That is, it decays. And this happens due to a lack of rehearsal. So what does this look like? Well, it happens all the time. You get some information in short-term memory, but you simply don't take the time or put in the effort to memorize that information, to rehearse it, and therefore it just never gets passed on to long-term memory in the first place. The next type of short-term memory error is called interference. And this also happens all the time. And this is when you have information in short-term memory, but that information is lost due to competition from additional incoming information. That is, there's some other information interfering with your ability to remember the information at present. And there are two main types of interference. I want to talk about both in turn. The first is called retroactive interference. And this is a form of interference in which learning new information interferes with the memory you have of old information. So what does this look like? Let's say you have a French test coming up. So you say, okay, I have a French test coming up. I'm going to study French first, okay? I'm taking other classes, for example, Spanish as well, but I need to really get my French studying out of the way because that's the number one priority. So you study your French. And then you say, okay, well, you know what? I got my French studying done. I still have a day or two, so I'm going to use that time wisely. I'm going to study some Spanish. And then you get around to your French test, and let's say you totally bomb. Okay, why might this happen? Well, one possibility is that you encountered retroactive interference. What might have happened is you got your French information down, right? You have that information. So that's your memory of old information, just to map this onto the definition you're looking at here. Then you study Spanish. So this is the learning of new information. So what might happen is that new information coming in might interfere with the old information of the French that you already had down. So then when it comes time to sit down and take your French test, you might be trying to think of French words, but you can't get those Spanish words out of your head. So here the new information of Spanish is interfering with the old information of French. Next we have proactive interference, which works very similarly, but in the opposite direction. Proactive interference is a form of interference in which memory of old information interferes with the learning of new information. Okay, so again, you're taking Spanish and French and all of that. So let's say, you know what? I know about retroactive interference and I don't want that to happen. So what am I going to do? I'm going to study my French first, get it out of the way. Let's say you have a Spanish test coming up, right? So I'm going to study French first. I'm going to get that out of the way so that I don't have any French interfering with my Spanish retroactively. So then you get your French out of the way. Then you study for your test. You study Spanish for your Spanish test. You take your Spanish test and again, you bomb. <laughs> okay, unfortunate. But what might have happened is proactive interference. So the memory of old information, the French that you thought you had gotten out of the way, interferes with the learning of the new information, the Spanish. So when you're trying to learn those Spanish words, well, maybe those French words that you already learned, you know, yesterday or whatever, kept coming up. And then when it came time to take the Spanish test, you didn't know the Spanish material quite as well because that old French information kept getting in the way. I want to make one final note about memory errors. These are all about short-term memory errors, but what about long-term memory errors? There is a little bit of a distinction. Oftentimes, short-term memory errors tend to be acoustic, meaning about sound. You simply misheard somebody, right? And so the information in your 10 to 20 second short-term memory is off. Long-term memory errors, in contrast, tend to be semantic, meaning about meaning. So as an example, a long-term memory error might be mistaking a canary for a finch, okay? Two different kinds of birds. It's possible that you just never really learned the difference uh, too well in the first place, and so you mistake one for the other. A short-term memory error version of that might be mistaking a canary for a Clefairy, for example, right? A Pokemon, sorry if you don't get the reference. But Making this mistake is an acoustic. You heard somebody wrong, and so you made an error, and what gets passed on to long-term memory ends up being something totally off. Now let's shift gears, though, and let's talk about the specificity of memory. And this is going to be our segue into discussing the ways in which we can use the information that psychologists have learned about memory to enhance the ways in which we learn.
The specificity of memory is this principle here. We're more likely to remember something when the learning conditions match the retrieval conditions. That is to say, you're much more likely to remember something, to be able to recall something on a test, for example, or just in general, when you learn in the same place as where you're tested on that material, where you have to recall that information. And there are two main types of uh, sort of learning that illustrate the specificity of memory. It's called context-dependent learning, and the second is called state-dependent learning. I'm going to tell you a definition of each and a study that goes over this and kind of illustrates this effect. Context-dependent learning is where we see enhanced retrieval, which is just a better way of saying, uh, you know, superior memory, when the external context is consistent from learning to test. What does this mean in practical terms? Well, if you do all your studying at a library, it would be great if you could also take your test at the library. The external context should be consistent from learning to test. You'll see better memory. Unfortunately, what often happens is, you know, you learn at a library or whatever, or at your dorm, or at your apartment or house, and then you're tested in a classroom, a different external context. What does this mean? This means that when you're tested, none of the cues are the same. The room is totally different. The people there are different, right? The smells are different. And it turns out those little tiny cues, when you learn something and it smelled a certain way, if it smells a certain way again, it's easier to recall the information you learned. But again, that doesn't always happen. So here's a really classic example. I love this study and I think it's hilarious. Both of these studies I'm going to present are, are just awesome and fascinating. As you can see, this is a study about learning. And what they did is they did an experiment where they had participants learn some information. And for half of the participants, they learned that information on land, normally, right? For the other half of participants, they had to learn that information underwater. How would you like to be a participant in that study, right? I think that's awesome. So then they were tested either on land or underwater. So picture this, some people had a sort of consistent from learning to test context. So for some people, they learned the information on land and then they were tested on land. For other people, it was an inconsistent sort of uh, a mismatch between learning and test. So for some people, they learned on land and then they were tested underwater. And then the reverse was true as well. Some people learned underwater and were also tested underwater, so there's a match. Some people learned underwater and they were tested on land. So I'm going to plot the results. The results here are showing the percentage that people remembered. So just how good did they do when asked to recall that information that they learned? So let's start with the people who learned on land. What you can see here is that if you learned on land and were tested on land, you did absolutely great, right? You had a great percentage remembered, and that's right here where you can see that. Now for some people, they were, again, learning on land and then tested underwater. Look how poorly they did because there's a mismatch. They learned on land but were tested underwater. Okay, now next, what about the people who learned underwater? We see the exact opposite results, but results that reflect the same idea. So if you learned underwater and then were tested underwater, you remembered quite a bit. You did fantastic. Just the, as good as the people who learned on land and were tested on land. But if there's a mismatch, if you learned underwater and then were tested on land, you did very poorly. There's a mismatch in the context from learning to test, and as a result, we see impaired performance. I think that's fascinating. Next, let's talk about state-dependent learning. This is very similar to context-dependent learning, except instead of talking about the external environment, we're talking about the individual's internal state. So state-dependent learning is enhanced retrieval, superior memory, when the individual's internal state is consistent from learning to test. And you can see the example I give here is coffee. I encounter this all the time where I have students in my classes, they're not coffee drinkers, but right before the final exam, they're stressed, they feel like they need a boost, and so they drink a ton of coffee. Well, think about what this is doing. This is creating a mismatch. All of your learning happened without coffee in a much more relaxed internal state. That's what you did all your studying um, as. But then comes time for the test. Now you have a very different internal state because you're drinking tons of uh, coffee, right? So this is going to end up impairing your ability to perform on the test. It's going to impair your memory, even though it feels like you're doing something good.
Now the study for this is even more hilarious. Learning while drunk, okay? Yes, this is an ethically approved study. They did this with real people who were of age. Um, students at a university participated in the study where they, uh, it was a similar sort of setup to the last study underwater, except uh, now we're talking about internal states instead of the external context. So they had people remember some information, learn some information, and then they tested those people. Uh, it was another experiment in which everything was randomly assigned. Some people learned the information while sober, as hopefully most people do. Uh, and then some people were randomly assigned to be in the condition in which they learned the information while drunk. So they got drunk and then learned the information. And then they were either tested sober or tested drunk. Okay, let's go through the results, this time in the form of a bar graph. Let's start with the people who were tested sober. So the people who learned the information sober, that's what you're looking at here so far. And then they were tested sober. What do you think happened? They probably did great, right? And that's what we see. They remembered quite a bit. This is how most learning takes place, hopefully. Uh, learning sober, tested sober. What about people who learned the information while drunk and then sobered up and then were tested, they remembered very little because there's a mismatch in their internal states. And this is probably not too surprising, right? If you learn some information drunk uh, and then you're tested sober, you probably won't remember well. Next, what about the people who learned the information sober but were tested drunk? Again, a mismatch, they did very poorly. So probably nothing too surprising yet, but here's what I think is fascinating and frankly quite hilarious. What about the people who learned drunk and then were tested drunk. Look at the results. They remembered everything really well. Just as good as the people who learned sober and were tested sober. I think this is hilarious. So I guess if you're doing all your studying while drunk, you might as well take the test while drunk too.